Penny, are you all squared away? So oh, I can see you. <laughs> cool. Are you, all, you all set now? I think so. My machine, my uh, PC is buffering for some reason. So, but I can see people, but it's buffering. So we'll just see what happens. Okay. Everybody else ready to go? All right. Uh, welcome to the Monday, September 14th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, can we get the roll call from town clerk, please? Chairman Adams. Councilor Devereaux. Here. Councilor Gabrielson. Here. Councilor Garvin. Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan. Here. Councilor Straw. Here. We do have a quorum. Thank you very much, Deb. Uh, would you all please join into the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States, States of, America, of America and to, and the, to the Republic for which, for which it, stands, it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. Thank you very much. Um, do any counselors have anything that they wish to report at this time? I do. Go ahead, Penny. Um, I just want to, uh, because I know we're still getting a lot of correspondence regarding uh, short-term rentals, and I just want to make sure that uh, uh, people out there are aware of the planning board workshop regarding short-term rentals on September 22nd. And I, I think that, um, I, I'm I'm glad that people are still uh, engaged in this uh, in this process, and I think all perspectives need to uh, be represented with the uh, planning board as they work through that ordinance. Um, and the other thing is the um, 2021 senior tax relief, making sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, I mean, it means a lot at this point in time. So. I, I know that's been a lot of correspondence around that, but the more we say, hopefully the more people can participate. Thank you, Penny, for both of those things. Anybody else have anything that they want to report on right now? Councilor Gaberson? Um, I just wanted to give a quick update. Um, Matt and I both attended the uh, first meeting of the Metro Region Coalition in a while um, last week and just wanted to let everybody know uh, that a lot of the issues we've been following around housing choice um, are going to stay on the agenda for that group. Um, and also, uh, I was pleased that they were, we've added some uh, items to the work plan looking at uh, responses to um, regional responses around COVID, as well as some of the work that we've been doing around uh, racial equity um, and trying to see what opportunities there may be for learning with other communities in the region. So. No specifics as of yet, but uh, I'll let you know that that's on the, on the agenda with other communities as well. Thank you very much for that. Any questions for Jeremy on that? Anybody else with anything to report on right now? Okay. Um, We'll go on to the Finance Committee report, which I will um, deliver. Um, so uh, in the packet uh, were the normal um, control and distribution uh, reports. So hopefully folks have had a chance to peruse those as well as the dashboard that Matt provided. Um, I uh, note Matt, and I don't know if you wanna give any other color commentary um, that you know, in all of the key revenue and expenditure areas that we focus on with the dashboard, we're running extremely close to forecast, uh, which I find um, both encouraging and um, just uh, interesting from a budgeting perspective. So um, I know uh, also I'll touch on that um, the work of the um, uh, annual audit um, has been done. Um, and so uh, our KO, our auditor, will be working on compiling that to deliver to us as a report um, uh, later on this fall, um, but that they were in and, um, uh, you know, doing their annual work and, and meeting with all the key stakeholders uh, involved in that process, both on the uh, municipal and school side. 
Uh, so we'll look forward to that upcoming. Matt, was there anything else you wanted to just add though from uh, um, your perspective on the dashboard? If I could, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, in particular, uh, is the building permit side of the equation, which is almost double to where we were at this point last year. Uh, speaking with Code Officer Ben McDougall about this, and uh, he, I, I, when I was uh, crafting the dashboard at the end of the week, I said, Ben, uh, you know, have you felt busy lately? Because uh, based on the numbers, you are extremely busy and uh, building seems to uh, continue in a very strong sector. Uh, from the revenue side, where at, at this point in time we're almost fifty-one thousand dollars in revenue. At this point last year we were at twenty-eight thousand dollars in revenue. So we're tracking about ten point two percent greater than we were uh, at this point. And so that's uh, you know, what we saw this spring as far as building permit activity continues through the summer uh, and going into the fall. So that's encouraging, at least from a from a uh, dollars and cents standpoint, as well as our excise taxes. And with uh, you know. There was some concern uh, with our operations being somewhat restricted by appointment only, but uh, seems to be uh, folks are, are moving along with that extremely well. Uh, and, and our staff is really uh, performing uh, a lot of work to keep and, and helps uh, residents as far as registering their cars. And it shows in our, in our excise tax revenue, which is a, about 2% greater than we were at this point last year as well. So uh, speaking with other managers in the region, uh, there has been and uh, does continue to be a, sec a strong sector is the new car sales. Uh, many communities are finding that uh, they do have a lot of new registrations that are taking place. So I think that's reflecting in our in our excise registration. And then uh, revenue sharing as well. Uh, as you know, <laughs> painfully so, that we did go through two different budgets this past spring. And one of the big uh, rewrites on that was our anticipated revenue from revenue sharing through the state that seemed to have been a very good decision as uh, we're tracking where we should be and uh, we're looking to be on course where we're, where we're anticipating to be at this point uh, last year. So as you see, last year we're at 18.4% and this year we're at 17.8%. So we're, based on the calendar at least, we should be tracking uh, what our anticipated revenues, if not exceeding it by a little bit at year's end, at least based on the early, early trend. And then finally, uh, our pay and display revenue is catching up uh, quickly with where we should have been uh, at this point, looking at the week-on-week -week revenues as they do come in, uh, we've seen a steady increase as, as, as traffic, quite frankly, has increased at the park. So uh, we did get through a couple of uh, busy holiday weekends and the end of the summer. So, uh, it, but it's been, we've been blessed with good weather. And I think that has, has come about with people taking advantage of coming to the park. So that's, that's helped us recover where we started off a little weekly there. So. All in all, we're looking at good things uh, and our, our expenditures. I was talking with staff, uh, well, with uh, department heads today, and they've done a good job trying to, you know, continue being frugal when it comes to our expenditures to make sure that uh, we do stay on, in line with where we should be for the year. And it's, and it's reflected, as you see, uh, through many of our other lines. The one area that is significantly different from last year uh, was on diesel and gasoline, where we were at 4,000 bucks last year, basically spent an hour at 13, but that comes down with the timing of when our purchases took place. Uh, we're not using a great deal, much more fuel. It just happens to be that the invoice is paid uh, during that month where it, it might've shown up next month. So, but all in all, uh, we're, we're in decent shape and I'm very encouraged at this point uh, as we go into the second quarter. Matt, quick question on the um, state revenue side. I know that um, uh, I, I saw in the last week or two, um, you know, some um, information coming out of the governor's office around, you know, how, how she was looking and she and her staff were looking to close the, the forecasted gap. Uh, are you hearing anything? I haven't seen a ton other than that, you know, some of the newsletter kind of stuff that circulates our way from Maine Municipal Association, but what are you and sort of other managers hearing about the more forward looking um, projections on revenue sharing? Well, I, th I think the big thing was, uh, you know, back when they came up with their original forecast uh, in, in March, they had us at about uh, $860,000. And that's when, uh, you know, when things started to hit and is when we made, you know, to be frank, a scientific uh, estimate as to try to get down to where we needed to be. And uh, so we've built that into where, where we should be. Um, I think the state is looking to, to shore up their budget by uh, coming uh, by not filling uh, open positions. And they have multiple lines of revenue that, uh, that quite frankly, we don't 
we don't have to concern ourselves with. I know it sounds funny, but our budgets are just structured differently and they're coming into a next legislative session. So they're finishing up their, their one budget and they have to start crafting the next one with the new, with the new legislature seats. So I think uh, they need to do some housekeeping on their end, but as far as uh, the, the formula that what, how they advance and distribute uh, revenue sharing, we have not uh, heard anything as far as changing the percentages as to how they distribute that, uh, that income that does come in. So, uh, but I do think it was, it was very wise to have done what we, what we did earlier in the spring budget. So that, that seems to have been uh, a good point. Okay. Uh, are there other questions for Matt or myself on the finance report? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move on to citizen opportunity for items that are not on tonight's agenda. And in addition to um, the council, there's 11 folks from the public, now 12 currently um, joining us over the Zoom meeting. Um, so if there are any members of the public that wish to speak at this time, please use the raise hand function uh, in Zoom which depending if you're uh, on a desktop or um, phone or tablet might either be in the bottom corner or in the upper more um, three dots area. But so if anybody has a question, please raise your hand and you'll be recognized to speak. I'm not seeing any hands going up. All right, seeing none, Matt, would you please give us your manager's report? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I'd be very happy to. Uh, first, I, full disclosure, I did not ask uh, Councillor Penny Jordan to tee up what I'm about to start speaking about. Uh, it just happens to be coincidence, but I uh, wanted to take the opportunity to remind folks that on the town's website, uh, there is uh, currently an article relating to the Senior Citizen Tax Relief Program, uh, letting people know that uh, the applications are now available. Uh, tax Assessor last week mailed out 200 application packets uh, across the town to prior recipients and the other people who have requested applications but did not uh, did not receive them last year uh, due to missing the deadline or for other reasons but have or have become knowledgeable of it so we've reached out to those folks and made sure that they have uh, received the applications the program has a maximum benefit of five hundred dollars for Cape Elizabeth residents 65 years or older and have lived in their home for 10 years and either own or rent and they have an annual household of 60, household income of $60,000 or less. And the applications, as I said, are available on the town's website, or you can call 799-1619, and they would be happy to take your information and mail a packet to you as well. So uh, last year we had, uh, the first year I think Clint said we had 130 participants, and then this most recent year we had 165. So the, the, uh, it's growing, which is a good thing. And I think this year, the amount that we have set aside is $85,000 currently in the budget. So we should be uh, we should be in good shape as far as meeting the need, but we do want those who are eligible, please come forward and we'd be happy to help you fill them out as well. So uh, stand by for future updates as, as the program advances. Uh, the recycling center fees have resumed on September 8th. Now, fees for disposal of leaf and yard waste, brush, and other demolition materials at the recycling center were suspended back in March due to concerns of the pandemic. Uh, this was primarily due to attempting to minimize exposure of staff and patrons. And over the past months, materials have been installed to provide protection such as plexiglass shields and other personal protective equipment for staff. And now we are able to conduct transactions. Uh, that in conjunction with the, the rule on mask wearing has, uh, has come down through the executive order. Uh, we feel that we can do that and provide that safely at this, at this time. Public Works Director Jay Reynolds is working on a reopening plan for the swap shop and for returnable bottles. And I'm afraid I misspoke last month. I thought that we were uh, going to be able to receive returnable bottles and cans. At, uh, however, our partner firm uh, we've been working with is experiencing uh, staff shortages and is unable to handle the volume at this point in time. But we are exploring other options and should have a solution shortly. So uh, as we receive updates, we will place those on the website and try to share the, share the word because I know there are a number of people who would like to uh, donate their returnables. Finally, I have a really good, uh, good news for the council and I, I hope this uh, 
will provide you some uh, some positive vibes, for lack of a better term. But Fire Chief uh, Gleason provided me with a letter that he received of thanks uh, to the Fire and Rescue Department that they received from a mother of a 35-year-old man who suffered a heart attack recently when visiting Cape Elizabeth. The town's paramedics and emergency medical technicians responded within five minutes of the call. That's not, you know, it, that was literally the call started and five minutes later they were there. Uh, and they employed the towns, they have a, a, a device called a Lucas device, which is an auto CPR device, and which provided the treatment, which was essential in saving this young man's life. The chief and I wanted to thank the council for the support that you provide the department with equipment such as this, which made the difference between life and death on this day. It's with, it's, it is great to be able to share a positive ending to what could have been a tragedy. Uh, but he received the nicest letter from uh, this young man's mother, who's a selectman in the town that uh, in the town that they live in. So uh, I think uh, she understands the job that uh, that the fire chief does and, the, and the, that our good people do. So, but I thought that's a great story for for the council. And so many times we hear bad news these days. Uh, it's good to hear good news. And uh, chief just wanted me to share his appreciation for the support that the council has provided the department over the years. And uh, you know, this device, it does provide the CPR actions that, that is needed that, you know, if, if you go on a call uh, to have the rotation of folks who have to go through to do CPR, it gets exhausting. And to maintain that, uh, you know, part of it was helped by, by uh, the young man's um, fiance's mom knew CPR and provided some of that until they got there five minutes later. But great story, happy, happy ending. So uh, it's, good to, it's good to have a win, as the chief said. So. That's uh, my full report this evening. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think so. Are there any questions for Matt? Before we move on to the rest of the agenda, I just had a couple of things that um, I wanted to, um, I guess, uh, uh, tag on to Matt's report. Number one, um, in a similar bit of good news, um, just want to uh, draw attention and uh, extend the council's congratulations to school resource officer Dave Galvin. Uh, who this month is being honored um, by the Trauma Intervention Program of Portland um, and Maine Behavioral Healthcare uh, for uh, his efforts and work, uh, along with a number of other great um, uh, frontline personnel um, that are, uh, you know, uh, really integral um, to helping uh, in the behavioral health community uh, in Greater Portland. So. Uh, want to recognize him and the great work um, that he's been doing there. Um, I also want to note the passing of a couple of um, um, uh, fellow capers. Um, and uh, the first is Helen Tarling, who passed away um, uh, earlier this month, um, just shy of her 104th birthday. Um, but uh, a, a, a true caper born on the farm, uh, attended Bowery Beach School, um, and then lift out our final days at the landing um, and her family I know uh, has deep roots in the community um, and she will be missed as will Jack Keneally um, who those of us who go onto the website so frequently um, for meeting agendas and, and other information will always see Jack's work and uh, we're sad to learn of his passing uh, late last month um, and for, for both of them and to their families uh, I extend the condolences of the council and uh, I know that we'll all remember them, remember them fondly. So um, with that, we'll move on to our regular agenda and we'll start uh, with item number 118-2020, general assistance appendices. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Did you wanna do so the minutes first? Oh, I will, thank you. I'm out of practice. Thank you, Penny. <laughs> so before we get to that item, um, is there a motion for uh, the minutes of the August 10th 2020 meeting. So moved. I move the minutes as presented. Uh, moved to approve by Councilor Gabrielson, seconded by Councilor Devereaux. Is that, did I hear, no, or Penny? Yeah. Penny? Okay, uh, is there any discussion? Seeing no hands, uh, can we have a roll call vote? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Pro Ten Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Now we'll go to 118 2020, General Assistance Appendices. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? 
Seeing no hands raised. Um, this is a, a annual agenda item that we have. Um, uh, the recommendation is that we set the to a public hearing. Um, uh, the general assistance ordinance appendices A through H uh, and that that uh, public hearing be at our next regular meeting on Wednesday, October 14th, 2020 at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Councilor Straw. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Councilor, Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? I have a quick question. Go ahead, Councilor um, I'm just wondering, uh, and Matt can what is the, on page 117 of the document, there's this redlined misconduct and it seems kind of uh, not related to the uh, A through H. Can you explain to me how that's related to um, the overall appendices? Give me just a moment to catch up with you, if I may, <laughs> Councilor Jordan. <laughs> Go to 117. Yeah, I'm, I'm scrolling there as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Oh, the red lines would be the changes from uh, from last year to this year. I mean, but what, did, what does that misconduct of employees have to do with the um, the general assistance um, tables? If, uh, if I may be uh, granted a, a, a couple of weeks to do that and get the research, I can find out from MMA about what the changes are related to and we'd be able to report back. Yeah, I was just trying to draw the relationship. It didn't make sense to me. It looks I like read there was it. a public law that changed in uh, in 2019 uh, that may be the, may be the difference there because it may have been revised up above where you see at the bottom of uh, or on, on page or under appendix one where the, where the, the cross out ends. You see at the bottom is like 1999 yeah. chapter 464 subsection two new and then yeah. you go down scroll down a little bit you've got a new public law chapter 125 so, uh, section one so I, I think what happened is that the legislature may have changed uh, that law and revised it with a new law that was passed in 2019. And so they amended that language uh, by striking out the old and inserting the new. The reason behind that, I can find out uh, why that law uh, section was changed. I'll just have to make a call to MMA oh. to, to find out about it. Uh, as I read it, I, I kind of understood the concept of why that um, uh, employee misconduct. If you read it, you can understand what uh, the changes represented. But my question is, what does that have to do with general assistance? Yeah, I, I will find out that answer. That's the question. <laughs> okay. I'll have that ready for next month. Okay. That's a good one. Thank you for so that. Isn't that going to, but we're going to have a public hearing or potentially we'll be having public hearing on the general assistance um, a, pen, a proposal change, you know. Um, so anyway, you might need to know it before people go to a public hearing. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, a phone call away. So I'll, I'll call Kate Dufour tomorrow at MMA. Cool. So the other thing I would, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing I would ask um, in advance of the public hearing, I know um, certainly last year, and I can't remember, it might've been the year before too, that there um, has been one of these appendices that has, generated discussion and, um, uh, you know, a, a little bit further examination uh, by the council. I think it was G the GA maximums. Yeah, the G okay. yeah. Yeah. So um, my, my request just uh, administratively would be for anybody that has, um, you know, a perspective on that or if you'd like that to come, um, you know, come with, uh, uh, a point of view on that or a recommendation um, uh, to be put forward. So, okay. I, I will follow up on that as well with our GA yeah. administrator. So, well, and counselors too. I, I know, I, I think what I'm, what I'm saying is that if, if folks are looking to deviate or do something different, um, put some thought into what that might be and um, potentially 
um, you know, have a, have a draft um, proposal, so. I think Valerie. Um, yeah, Adam, I mean, I know she's the one that's brought the, brought this up right. and, and she obviously she has a conflict tonight, but. She proposed changes last year, so yeah. we could so, go back to those minutes. Yep, yeah. and to, and I'll, I'll I'll be happy to circle up with her too, just to to raise her awareness to this coming back around. But because I I just remember um, logistically us being sort of held up a little bit um, by. Um, having to wait and re redraft and all that kind of stuff. So uh, any other discussion then on this item or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion on the table to refer this to a public hearing on October 14th. Deb, could you give us a roll call, please? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Item number 119-2020 is the appointments committee recommendations to the new ad hoc civil rights committee. Is there anybody from the public uh, now up to about 13 folks that would like to speak on this item? If so, please raise your hand now. I don't see any hands raised. So um, I'm going to offer um, Councilor Devereaux, uh, Chair of the Appointments Committee, the opportunity to introduce this item. Okay, first of all, I'd like to, um, to thank everyone, all of the applicants. We had 17 applicants for seven positions. Everyone was exceptional. It's um, such an honor to be part of a community that has people who are um, so talented and willing to give their time so thank you. We, um, it wasn't a, an easy decision. We, like I said, we had 17 fabulous applicants. Um, so as you can see, do you want me to read off the names of the people? Sure, thank you. Okay. So um, Keila Alston Griffin, Diraj Kare, Kimberly Monahan, Paul Seidman, Jim Sparks, Melanie Thomas, Rafina Young, and then we have uh, Miriam Eshlovanos, who's a student, a sophomore at Cape Elizabeth High School, who will be our student representative. Um, and I want to disclose that I um, know Jim Sparks' wife and daughter through speech and debate. I don't know that I'd ever met um, Jim Sparks before, and I, um, I'm acquainted with Paul Seidman, Melanie Thomas, and Rafina Young, the other people I had never met before. So I just want to let everyone know that. Um, I don't feel that my um, being acquainted with those people or um, Jim Sparks' wife and daughter led to any bias or inability to be fair in this process. But these are um, the people that we have chosen and um, we're very excited about, about this new ad hoc committee. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? I so move. Go ahead. Uh, Councilor Devereux moves to approve the recommendation as the appointments committee. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Councilor Straw. It, I assume one of you wants to put your name forward as the uh, town council liaison as well. We might as well accomplish that at the same time. I would like to put my name forward. Uh, do we want to handle that as, um, do we need a motion on that? Do we want, and if so, do we want to do that separately or? Separate. It, it may be good to do two, uh, to do two separate okay. motions, but. Uh, okay, why don't we, um, yeah, why don't we vote on this and then we'll, we'll have that as a separate, um, separate motion. Um, and I, I just have a quick question. So um, you mentioned uh, Miriam as the student, one of the student representatives. Um, looking at the charge, it was up to two students. Was there, were the, there not other students interested or? 
We, we just had the one who applied. So there's okay. still a vacancy for the other student. My guess is since school hadn't started yet that yep. um, a lot of kids weren't aware of it. Fair enough. Other questions, discussion? Uh, I'll just say thank you to all the people who expressed an interest and uh, thank you for those who are offering to volunteer their time and talent on this group. Uh, thank you to the appointments committee for your work in putting together the recommendation and with no further discussion or questions, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you very much. So related to that, I'll entertain a motion to appoint uh, Councillor Devereaux as the uh, representative non-voting ex officio member um, from the council. Is there uh, a motion to that effect? So moved. Councillor Straw, is there a second? I'll second. That's your job to thank Penny. Uh, I guess any discussion? So. Anyone else interested? Otherwise, sounds great to me. You've got free time for the next couple of months. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> Anybody else? Valerie, thank you very much for your interest. And I think, uh, I think you'll do great on this and I appreciate your willingness to do it. Uh, with that, a roll call vote, please, Deb. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. Your motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is item number 120-2020, the Willowbrook Calvert Grant. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak about this item? Oh. Seeing none. Um, I know that um, in our packet, we were provided a memo from town planner Maureen O'Meara. She's also uh, joining us this evening, and I see that her mic is open. So Maureen, would you, uh, for the benefit of the meeting, give us a little bit of an introduction on this item, please? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, pretty much all of you saw the uh, culvert study that was done last year, and I was able to present it with Bob Malley. And our winner of the 16 culverts in Cape Elizabeth at the worst culvert was Willowbrook. Um, and we are going after some grant money that we have never tried to go after before. I've had a lot of help from different people. Uh, and I just wanna make sure it's clear that uh, these are some big numbers I'm showing you, but some of them are really optional. So there's $88,000 in there that really is an optional placeholder uh, because we're going after a grant that is focused on environmental protection, on restoring wetlands that have been degraded or uh, maybe damaged because we have a constrained uh, wetland that's the uh, culvert that's not allowing tidal waters to flow. We're spending some money to do a tidal study. Um, and if the tidal study tells us that the uh, proposed culvert that we have is not correctly sized, the 88,000 is to buy the next one up. So we're hoping that we've, we've selected the right amount, but we are doing some very careful work with the title study. Um, also, one of the requirements of this grant is that you have to do six years worth of monitoring. So we would go in before the work is done and do some um, studies on title levels. And then we would be doing work five years after, um, once a year to look at what was going on as the title constriction is uh, resolved. So I just want to recognize uh, great, great help from Jake Amon from NWAR, uh, from Steve Harding and Shane Kelly. And there, there's some other folks out there that were really throwing me a lifeline and it was very, very helpful. And uh, we have a big in, uh, interview with this in early November, hoping to hear some good news around Thanksgiving. Great, thank you very much for the details and context there. So um, if the, uh, there are no questions at this time for Maureen, uh, would somebody like to make a motion to authorize the pursuit of the grant application? So moved. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson, is there a second? 
Second. Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Maureen, these are always my favorite agenda items that you bring to us when you're digging for cash. So <laughs> happy to see you. Uh, happy to see you uh, bring this forward, uh, and I hope uh, we'll cross our fingers that uh, it comes through. Twenty percent of the project price would be great. So, uh, seeing no other discussion, uh, roll call vote, please, Deb. Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. And the motion carries. Terrific. Uh, the next item is number 121-2020 uh, to refer to the ordinance committee non-commercial use of the boat launch near the entrance to Kettle Cove at the end of Crescent Beach. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? I don't see any hands raised. So um, Matt, can you give us an introduction on this? And, um, uh, turn over to you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Jim uh, Morrow raised his hands just as you were oh. uh, transitioning over. I just wanted to make sure he had the opportunity. Fair enough, yep. Uh, Jim, go ahead, your uh, name and address, if you don't mind, please, before your comments. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. We got you, Jim. Go ahead. May also be preemptive to the next item on the agenda. Hey, Jim, are you there? Did you want to speak on the Kettle Cove boat launch? All right. Why don't we? Um, why don't we? Uh, pause his mic then for a minute and um, yeah. I'll, I'll set Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, so go ahead, Matt. Why don't you give us an introduction and if, if Jim uh, Moore, if, if you do in fact want to speak on this item after Matt um, gives us the introduction, I'll be happy to come back to you if, if um, you still wanted to talk about this. So go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so as stated in my memo, over the course of the summer uh, season, it, with all public spaces, but specific on the coastal uh, coastal area, we saw an incre incredible increase in in use, quite frankly, in traffic. Uh, but and one of the areas that found it was also the uh, what we had always thought it was the non-commercial access point on, into Kettle Cove or onto the Crescent Beach end of uh, Kettle Cove, uh, which is not not the commercial area, which is currently the, you know, the large boat launch that's down there. It says commercial fishermen only. So uh, doing some research into that and reading about it, found that uh, sections 13-3-9 uh, and 13-2-4 in, uh, in our ordinances show that uh, that area is actually supposed to be restricted to commercial use only. Uh, specifically for uh, launching a watercraft or commercial fishing activities. That is uh, about as opposite of what it has traditionally been used for over the past, uh, you know, speaking with Ed Hunt, uh, who's worked for the, the town and the police department for uh, a good many years, it would be uh, a nice way to put it. But he has experience with remembering with Chief Pickering uh, initially came forward with uh, crafting this uh, beach access permit uh, language. What we found was, you know, a couple of different things taking place. People A were uh, getting the beach access pass, uh, making the representation that they were going to be uh, launching a boat onto the uh, onto the beach, and then uh, and then leaving thereafter. Found that they actually weren't launching a boat; they were going down and parking on the beach. Uh, so we that we had that had to increase our patrols as we went uh, through the summer. Uh, but it was it, it was a stretch because you know all these places had a lot of uh, a lot of pressure on them. So park staff had a hard time trying to respond as well as the PD, but once we were knowledgeable of it, we increased our patrols. But then reading the ordinance found that, okay, it says commercial only, uh, but it's been traditionally used. And even the Harbors Committee with their work uh, acknowledged that it was uh, primarily the non-commercial access point. 
Also, as you recall, we, we've submitted a planning grant that we received to help us try to improve that in the future. In the spring, we'll be looking to get a, a land and water uh, conservation grant to help us construct uh, an improved access point. But uh, in the intervening time period, uh, we'd like to see if we could get the conflict in the ordinance with the actual uh, activities uh, back in alignment, I guess. And that's why we brought this forward to try to uh, see if the council could refer that to the ordinance committee so then we could get that uh, corrected or decide what we want uh, further action to be. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'll go back to see if Jim Moore wants to speak on this issue. And if not, then we'll move on to motion and discussion. Jim, your mic is back open if you wanted to speak about this item. Okay. Can you hear me? We got you loud and clear, Jim. Your name and address, if you don't mind, please. Okay, yeah, Jim Moore at 5 Wombeck Road. I am in favor of a potential ordinance change for non-commercial use of the beach launch. Providing a recreational launch separate from commercial launch was discussed in the Harbors Committee with recommendations in 2018. This change appears to be in line with the Harbors Committee recommendations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, is there anybody else from the public that wanted to speak about this? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion from anybody on the council? I move that we um, send this to the ordinance committee review. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Penny. Jordan, any discussion? Councilor Straw. So uh, I think I understand this, but it isn't changing the existing commercial launch to allow non-commercial launching there, but instead uh, fixing the ordinance so that we're traditionally the non-commercial craft have launched to allow it to continue to occur in that non-commercial location. Is that right? Yes, that's, that's the desire is to... Uh... Yeah, get the, the ordinance to reflect reality and, and, and keep the peace among the fishermen and the non-commercial users. Got it. And I just have to say, I find this uh, incredibly depressing um, that, it, that, that there was any abuse of how we had things up and that, that just stinks um, for people to be coming up with ways to park on the beach when they're not. Anyway, I won't go there. Uh, but yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Strauss. Any other comments or discussion? Seeing none, uh, could we call a question? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is item number 122-2020 to refer to workshop further discussion uh, paper streets um, coming out of uh, most recent uh, mainstream judicial court decision. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? I see no hands raised. Oh, there's uh, Anita Pettit. Anita, if you wouldn't mind with your name and address before your comments, please. Matt, I'll open up your mic in just a second. Go ahead. Hi, you can hear me? We've got you, thank you very Anita much. Anita Pettit, uh, 8 Katahdin Road. I wanna thank the town council for its efforts to date regarding the Surfside Atlantic Place Paper Street lawsuit. Um, after all the time and money that went into that effort, now's the time to move forward and finally accept these paper streets or street. This can has been kicked down the road for far too long. I would ask the town council to finish the job that the community has so clearly supported. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pettit. Is there any uh, other public comment at this time? I see no other hands raised. So seeing none, um, so again, um, this item uh, is before us tonight uh, as a result of a uh, recent court decision received by the council in town. Um, the proposed order tonight is to set to a workshop at our Wednesday, October 7th, 
uh, meeting. Uh, further discussion on potential next steps. Is there a motion? Moved by Councillor Devereaux. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Okay. Uh, next up is item number 123-2020, parking on the town farm parcel. Is there anybody from the public that wants to talk about this item? I see no hands raised. Um, Matt, this looks similar to the um, Kettle Cove item about reconciling current use to uh, ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the beauties of the pandemic is you have opportunities to read items in the ordinances that uh, you might not have had the opportunity to read over, over many years. Uh, this was one of those. Uh, actually came to mind uh, with a conversation with a local co contractor who wanted to donate uh, time and materials to improve the, uh, the small parking area because uh, he'd noticed multiple times over the years cars being extracted out by tow trucks as they were buried in the mud because uh, it does get very soft and, and muddy during the wet season. Uh, over the past 20 years, at least, uh, folks have been parking on the parcel in a very small area that must have organically uh, come about uh, as far as developing as a small parking area for folks who go and walk and explore the, uh, explore the town farm parcel. Uh, they walk the dogs there. It's one of our off-leash areas. Uh, we do have parking further up the street, but uh, uh, Folks generally tend to at least, uh, you know, anywhere from one to six cars generally uh, park in there when they explore the area. But then uh, coming back to talk to Ben uh, McDougall, our code officer, about saying, I'd like to explore this and see if this is something we could bring to the council for action. Uh, he said, well, let me check the ordinance and came back and said, well, it says right here, no parking on the town farm parcel. And uh, so much to all of our surprise, that was the language. So as you noticed on the... I also included a, uh, a copy of the current ordinance that we have, uh, looking to have a small area that uh, you might have noticed with the little map that I included as well, uh, possibly have parking in that area specifically defined. Uh, you know, we could find a way to, to say, you know, no other area to have it, but this seems to have worked for quite a long time, uh, but yet it's completely in violation of the ordinance. So uh, th I'm, I'm I, I would venture a guess that many of the council did not know that that was not a permitted use uh, when you saw cars there on your way back and forth to the recycling center uh, or that part of town, but, uh, but it, it does exist that way. So that's why I brought that forward to council to see if, uh, if the ordinance committee, and then uh, if they decide to go forward with it, this would also have to be referred to the uh, planning board as well, because it would be a revision of the, uh, of the, of the, of the zoning ordinance. Okay. Um, is there anybody uh, from the council that would like to make a motion? I will. Go ahead, Councilor um, Jordan. Okay. I move that we uh, refer this item to the ordinance committee in order to um, assess the parking at uh the town farm the poor farm sorry um and to develop a recommendation second we have a motion by council jordan second by council straw any discussion seeing none deb could you call oh, the vote please sorry i i'm sorry oh, I sorry i didn't see your hand go ahead Councilor no, Abelson. um so i i guess one thought that I have on this is um, there's also a, a trail misalignment here. Um, the, the trail connector that go, comes from the Gull Crest property over by the cross-country ski trails comes out 
probably 400 feet up the road and you have to walk on the shoulder. If we're looking at, at amending the ordinance anyway, I wonder if it's also not worth looking at where the parking is located. Um, I mean, I suppose you could build a trail connector just as easily, but um, given how much is on ordinance committee's plate right now, I almost wonder if referring this to conservation committee for a recommendation that would include the ordinance lane change um, and also give them an opportunity to look at where this parking should best be located might not be a better um, move. I'm fine to recommend it to ordinance. I just wanted to, uh, well, we've got the opportunity to raise it. Um, it sounds like either way, um, the ordinance needs to change no matter where it's located. I, I don't think the ordinance um, specifically, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that calls out the location just the location. that it's not permitted on the property, right? So, right, just that yes, um, it's not permitted, period. Yeah, and so because of the longer process that would be involved in, yeah. as Matt just said, getting the ordinance updated, inclusive of public hearing and everything, uh, referral to the planning board and the like, I, I think it probably makes sense to get that started um, regardless. It's not to say that these things can't happen on a parallel path, um, but it'll also just yeah. you know, bring the current conditions better in line with the regulations then too. Um, Council Jordan, Penny Jordan. Um, there's nothing to say that the ordinance committee wouldn't consult with the conservation commission on their thoughts around the parking. So it could be done in concert, so. Yeah, that'd be great. Council Straw. And out of curiosity, Jeremy, uh, the, the area uh, potentially that you're referring to is that's, um, and I don't know where the boundaries are of the, uh, the, the town farm. Is that then outside of the boundaries of the town farm? Do you know, or? No, uh, no, unfortunately. And I only know it because I come up, come out there with, yeah. Not having known you weren't supposed to park here, <laughs> cross country skiing, <laughs> and I always I always debate whether or not I should put my skis back on and ski through the field or just on the road. But <laughs> um, I have a completely tangential question to this uh, item, but it, it is related, um, and that is Matt. Do you? I, I know that I don't think this year, and I don't think last year either, that field has been being actively hayed like it was. Um, for a number of years. Um, and I, I just don't, I didn't know if you or either Councilors Jordan knew sort of what the current status is. It, it, sh it should be there and right here in the near term. Uh, okay. Usually they wait until after the Monarch butterflies have uh, finished their uh, finished their business uh, for lack of yeah. a better term. And, uh, and uh, so I, I did speak with Jay Reynolds about that uh, a week and a half or so ago about it and said, you know, uh, the field over there and he, and he said yep it's on my schedule bob told me uh so but it is uh, scheduled to be done this uh, i think at the latter part of this month and again maybe for either penny or caitlin to answer but is, is there any other active interest in in taking over that hanging operation or do you that you're aware of at all or no okay i think it's because they have to wait so long yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, it's Council about Jordan. the monarch butterflies. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, if if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah. we 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 have received emails uh, about concerns about that uh, in, during my tenure as manager uh, for concerns about that as far as uh, have that management and uh, but uh, we were a little early. I think my second year as manager, and it was pointed out to uh, Bob, and so we do wait a little bit a uh, little bit later, but. Uh, but I understand your point. <laughs> uh, any other discussion? All right, now I'll ask for Deb to read the roll. So Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is item number 124-2020, the annual municipal election warrant. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? And we're down to eight attendees. 
in the public right now. I see no hands raised. Um, Deb, would you please um, give us an introduction on this item, if you wouldn't mind? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, the election warrant is before you for the municipal election to be held on Tuesday, November 3rd. It will be held along with the general election. It calls for two members of the town council, two members of the school board, both for th are all for three-year terms. And we also have uh, a member of the Portland Water District Board of Trustees. Uh, we share a representative with the city of South Portland. Um, that is a five-year term. And again, election on Tuesday, November 3rd. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, at the gymnasium. Um, Chairman Garvin, I have some information um, as well. I don't know if you want me to do that after the vote or, or whenever, but... Uh, no, I, I, I know that um, you're talking to Matt, we had talked about using this time to talk a little bit more broadly about election procedure and um, status of um, absentee ballots and all that kind of stuff. So I think this is a good time to just have you cover off on, on everything you've got, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. I'd be happy to share with you um, what I have to this point. We are still working on details. This is a process. Um, I think I'd like to start by saying that um, for many years, Maine has had absentee balloting. Um, when the pandemic hit, Maine did not have to create um, another voting procedure uh, other than on the polls on election day. Uh, we've had the ability to do uh, absentee ballots to be mailed to voters and returned by mail and, and now by the availability of a drop box, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, there's no reason to believe that these well-established absentee voting laws and protocols will not serve the citizens well in this election. Um, we've had a lot of people concerned about that and um, we are trying to assure them it's, it's still us administering the election. They are laws that have been in for many years. Fortunately, on the fly, so to speak, Maine did not have to come up with laws uh, particularly, you know, for ballots, for absentee ballots to be mailed. So that's a very good thing. And, and administratively, we appreciate it. And I think the voters understand uh, and appreciate it as well. Um, folks want to know when the val ballots will be available, like any election. They come to us approximately 30 days before an election. I don't know what day we will receive the ballots. Uh, but again, it will be early October. It will take us a few days to process the ballots and get that first mailing out. We have over 3,300 requests already, um, which you know is going to be record, record setting, I am sure. Um, just to give you an idea, in 2012 general election, we had 2,700 absentees. In November 2016, we had 3,800. In the election we just had two months ago, literally, uh, there was almost 3,000. So again, uh, we're on track for, you know, what we anticipate as, as record setting uh, absentee ballot totals. So um, if folks haven't requested their absentee ballot yet, um, and you wish to vote by absentee, not on election day, we would encourage you to get your request in uh, as soon as you can. Uh, right on the town's website, uh, for folks that do have um, access to the website. There's a big yellow bar that runs across the home page. Request your absentee ballot now. You can download a request form and mail it in or fax it. You can go on the online request uh, service that a lot of folks really enjoy that service because you do receive a confirmation. Uh, if either of those options don't work well for you, you can call my office and do a telephone uh, request. So again, that availability is now, matter of fact, three months before an election, folks can start requesting ballots. So we would encourage folks, uh, if they have not got their request in to do so, Thursday, October 29th, the Thursday before the election is the last day to mail out ballots. There is that deadline, uh, the Thursday prior. Uh, there's been a lot of questions on what are the options to return absentee ballots. Uh, again, mail is still an option. There's no reason to believe that returning an absentee ballot by mail is still not a viable option. As always with any mail we do, just make sure you leave enough time for the ballot to get back to us. We have ordered a drop box um, that 
should be in uh, just as we send out that first mailing. Uh, Matt and I uh, have been working with facilities uh, to make sure the cement pad, that pad goes down, et cetera, uh, ready for the drop box. It will be uh, in the front of town hall here, actually on the corner. Um, uh, before you get to the steps here at town hall, it will be red, white, and blue. It'll say ballot drop Cape Elizabeth. So it should be uh, very well uh, marked. Um, that ballot box just cost us over $2,500 uh, just for the box itself and the shipping. Um, my understanding is they uh, will be a reimbursement from the state uh, for perhaps up to $1,500. And we'll certainly pursue that, but we needed to get this ballot drop box ordered uh, so that we could get it in, in time. So, um, so that again is on its way. All those return instructions and other instructions will be included with the ballot when the ballots are mailed. So we do a kind of step-by-step -step instructions uh, for voters uh, that will be included with our absentee ballot. Um, we've had questions of, um, will my absentee ballot be counted? Um, if you submit your absentee ballot, we receive it by the deadline before the polls close. If your envelope is signed, um, if you had somebody aid the ballot with you, uh, the ballot, for instance, reading the ballot to you, as long as you have your witnesses' um, signatures, and again, that information is on the instructions. As long as your ballot is submitted properly before the deadline, your absentee ballot will be counted. Um, the question has been raised, what is to present a voter from voting twice in Cape Elizabeth? Um, when we receive a request, we log in the request. I will say that um, we are receiving two, three, and four requests from voters for this election. Uh, it's been very time consuming to go through all the duplicates. We probably have about a third of the requests that we're receiving now are all duplicates. Uh, people are emailing and calling more than once, confirming again that we received their requests, which we had just um, confirmed with them maybe a week or so ago. They're calling again to make sure nothing's changed. Um, so in terms of, again, voting twice, the, we'll log in the uh, application. When the ballots come in, we'll mail them out. Um, when the ballot comes back and everything is all right, we'll log in that the ballot has come back. There are, are instances where people get duplicates. In this last, last election, for instance, we had somebody that threw their ballot away. We had somebody that um, spilled coffee all over it. We had all different scenarios. So there are cases where a duplicate will be sent out. If someone's trying to try the system, so to speak, and says, oh, I'm just going to get two sets of mail and back, both back, when the first ballot comes back, we log that in. That's your ballot. That's the ballot that's going to be voted. If that second ballot, that duplicate happens to come back, that will be rejected as a duplicate. So one vote for folks. Um, and I'm confident that that folks will not be voting twice in Cape Elizabeth. So, or, you know, anywhere for that matter. So that's the checks and balances. So, uh, so to speak that we have on that. Um, it's amazing to see the number of new registrants that we have. If you look at it, we had an election last November, March, July that were very heavily attended. We're still getting dozens of new registrants daily. Um, so if anyone has moved to Cape Elizabeth, whether it's from another community in Maine or out of state, or if you've moved within Cape Elizabeth, a lot of people move within town. Uh, we need to uh, send you a new voter registration card. We'll walk you through that process. If you haven't already, um, please contact my office and we will get you registered to vote. Again, either a new registrant to Cape Elizabeth or a, an address change or name change. Some folks have had name changes as well. Uh, voter cards by mail or a third party voter drive uh, must be received in our office by a close of business on Monday, October 19th. So um, it's been a very active and interesting um, lead up or <laughs> to uh, this election. We still are waiting for some protocols from the governor's office. Um, we will uh, continue as we have information to post it on the town's website. Uh, for instance, when the absentee ballots come in, 
um, these sample ballots and so forth, those will be posted. Um, and I, I guess I would just talk a little bit about, uh, about safety of staff. Um, we are concerned about um, the potential um, public exposure that staff will have if folks don't avail themselves of absentee balloting, uh, you know, having us mail one out to them. And again, they can return it by mail or the Dropbox. Um, we are limited with a space here at Town Hall for any in-person voting, uh, and we will be posting hours for that. We're still on lockdown, so we'll have to put somebody at the door to receive voters. Um, and again, uh, and I talked to Matt today, and there, with the staff there and the size of the chamber, only about three voters can be with inside the building at one time anyway. And, you know, when we do have a voter, then we have to wash everything down and so forth. So, and we don't have, you know, lineup space outside of town hall and parking to accommodate literally hundreds of people, you know, here. Um, on election day, it's similar. The governor has limited the number of people in the polling place to 50, and that includes election staff. So you, when you look at 25 or 30 of us, uh, another 20 voters or so, that's all that can be um, in the polling place at once. Um, so that logistically, um, you know, could be difficult as well. Um, matter of fact, we don't have to put up as many voting booths because we're not going to be able to have that many people in at one time. So the governor has uh, done an order that, uh, you know, we don't have to put up as many voting booths. So I, I just, I hope that you know, folks think about these things as they decide when they're going to vote, uh, how they're going to vote. We understand that some people want to, you know, do it in person and go to the polls and we respect and we appreciate that. Uh, we would just would hope that they would think a little bit about uh, the exposure, you know, to our staff and, and to themselves with potentially public facing literally thousands of people. So um, we, uh, we would just ask them to think about that as they uh, make their decisions about November 3rd, so. Ted, thanks for all that detail and overview. Really appreciate it. I know um, you guys will be working to you know, keep all the information current on the website and on our social media platforms to try and keep um, folks informed. And I think we as counselors will do everything we can to help um, spread that word as well. Um, Chris, I saw your hand go up. I just have one quick question as well. Um, I, you, you referred, Deb, to um, some of the things you're still sort of waiting on um, from the governor and secretary of state's office. Um, is one of those things, whether or not you'll be able to begin counting absentee ballots earlier than you typically are able to? Oh, thank you. That was in the, in the governor's order um, that we can start a week before. Now, what that specific day is, is it seven days? Is it the Tuesday? Uh, we're waiting to hear from that. But that is one thing that, uh, as clerks, we submitted to the governor's office for consideration. So we will have a few days more uh, to process those absentee ballots in advance. Uh, for us, um, you know, as always, it would be the challenge to have staffing to do that and then to still do our operations of uh, getting ballots out to folks and receiving them and so forth. So yes, thank you for that. Uh, that was good news um, from the governor's office. And then the point you just touched on about staffing, I, I know I've seen um, certainly more than I recall in any of the years I've lived here, interest from, um, uh, you know, particularly friends and, and peers of mine expressing an interest in um, volunteering, um, uh, to assist or um, be a poll worker and all that kind of stuff. And so could you just, um, for the, for anybody that might be interested in that, what, what should they do? Yeah, they can certainly contact me. Uh, I will take their information. If we need additional staffing, we will contact them. We have already contacted a few new folks. Uh, something that is interesting that most people don't know, which they wouldn't if they didn't know the details of election law, we have to have a balance of the political parties uh, on election day. And uh, right now in Cape Elizabeth, we have over 50% of registrants in one particular party. And um, so it will continue to be a challenge to keep a balance of political parties. So most of the people that are calling are in one one party and not the other. So we will not be able to take everyone <laughs> in that party because we do have to have that balance. But we 
I encourage folks, you know, to contact me. They can certainly email me or call. I am literally keeping a list, jotting down what their interest is. And um, we will be calling some new folks and we have already, you know, just trying to get things lined up. So be happy to take uh, that information. And, you know, frankly, if, if it, if the schedule doesn't fit, so to speak, for this election, there's going to be more down the line. So I right. will be keeping that list. Great. Councilor Straw, your question? Uh, yeah, I'll see if I can pull this all together. This could be a couple of multifaceted components. Uh, just as an aside, as you were mentioning um, restrictions on number of bodies in the polling place and whatnot, it, I, I, I realized as I started trying to crunch the numbers in my head, it's a mathematical calculation as to the flow rate of voters you can have going through there. And that I can see how that could end up becoming a, a problem. That said, I, I thought you guys did a wonderful job dealing with COVID uh, previously. And then to tie in uh, Jamie's comment, which was gonna be my primary uh, question. I, I know like the school district was having problems where they're uh, sending out, they had been sending out pleas for substitutes and bus monitors and whatnot. And um, do you feel like uh, your traditional uh, poll workers, we, you have enough, uh, enough bodies signed up that have said, yeah, I'm, I'm good to go. I'm willing to be there uh, during, uh, during the pandemic uh, so that you feel like you have enough staff. And then beyond staffing, uh, do you feel like uh, you have all the resources you need or, and obviously it's impossible to predict how this is all gonna play out with COVID, but do, do you feel like you have what you need or do you need more from, from the town council? Thank you, um, Councilor Straw for that. I, I can't tell you how good it feels to have the support of the council and the manager. Um, you folks have always been very generous and understanding and, and that really is true. And, and not all my colleagues across the state can say that. Um, I've never spent so much money in all my 34 plus years that I have literally in the last few months. Um, you know, I, and I believe we spent it wisely. I, I think we spent it on things that we need to. We, you know, have our PPE. The state has provided some and frankly, we've supplemented it. Just in case their supply doesn't come in, I wanna make sure we have it. Um, you know, we've been ordering more voter cards. We've been doing, you know, above and beyond just to make sure, you know, that we are covered. And, and I know, and, and I think you folks and, and Matt certainly know we're not going to spend it frivolously. And, and, but, but I do feel confident that when we need something, if we need something, we are backed by the manager and the council. And, the, and again, not all my colleagues can say that. I mean, we understand budgets are tight, but it really is a good feeling to know that, um, you know, we have, we have that support. So that really has helped through this, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, any other questions for Deb comments before we um, look for a motion? All right. Um, I, I guess I have one quick question Deb. is this, so normally don't we have to sign these? Um, well, if you were here, but actually the clerk can sign on behalf of the council. Okay. So I'd be happy Fair to enough. do so. All right. Uh, so is uh, there a motion from anyone to approve the municipal election warrant uh, as presented? So moved. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Devereaux, any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, can we have the roll call for the vote, please? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garvin? Yes. The motion carries. Great. Last item on tonight's agenda is item number 125-2020, uh, discussion of the Ralph T. Gould Award. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? I see no hands raised. Um, is there anybody that would like to first uh, bring, bring up any discussion? I think Councilor Devereaux, you were the one that uh, requested the addition of this item to the agenda. Go ahead. Um, I I would like to um, put forward Bob Malley. I, he's uh, been with the town over 42 years. He's, I think that he is the epitome of this um, this award. So I would like to put forward his name. 
Okay. I agree. That's a good suggestion. We do double seconds. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll just ask if there, I don't know if anybody else had any other thoughts or other discussion or names put forward. Um, I, you know, enthusiastically agree. Um, so would anybody like to turn that into a motion or Matt, you want to add a comment? You're, You're on mute, Matt. Uh, Luckily my screen just told me right after you did. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, if I may, I notice we have a number of attendees from the public who are here uh, and the council, uh, you know, the discussion is, can you have this conversation in exact session so it can be a surprise. So the only request I have is that uh, you, you are here, if you could please just keep, uh, keep it under your hat until the formal presentation. I know uh, uh, it would be great to do that unless you want to let, you know, unless you want to be a, to provide a spoiler alert, but uh, otherwise it'd be great if, uh, if we could Bring this as a surprise to Bob because I, I couldn't agree more with the council. Uh, you know, with Bob's terms of service, I think uh, he meets meets and exceeds the definition of this award as you know as a friend as well as an employee and a dedicated person for the town and just just an incredible legacy. So I hear here on that. So thank you. All right. Um, did we have? Did we have a motion? No, yeah, no. Mr. Would somebody, would somebody like to make a formal motion, please? Councilor Devereaux. I so move that we name Bob Malley as the recipient of the Ralph T. Gould um, Award for 2020. Second. Is there a second? Uh, second. Any discussion? All in favor, Deborah? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? 100% yes. <laughs> and Chairman Garvin? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, are there any members remaining from the public that wish to speak on anything that was not on our agenda? Now is your opportunity. I see a hand raised from somebody listed as Pegasus. If you could give us your name and address once Matt opens up your microphone, you are, uh, go ahead. George Foley, uh, Highly Point Road, Cape Elizabeth. I uh, was wondering, I, I may have missed it. I got on late. I didn't realize that the time. Uh, did, have you guys talked about the paper streets issue at all? We did discuss that as an earlier agenda item. The only action was just um, a more administrative one to refer it to a workshop on the 7th. On the 7th uh, of we had, October? Yep, yeah, exactly. And awesome. um, we had one, one of your neighbors offered public comment, um, encouraging us to keep moving forward. So that was- I all. would like it that was, as well. I think it's a great thing and uh, we need to preserve it for, for everyone. So, but- Thank you very much. That's all I had. Yep. October 7th is the workshop date. Um, John C., your hand is raised. Once Matt opens up your microphone, uh, if you could just give us your name and address. Go ahead. Yes, this is uh, John Christie at 6 Albion Road. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm curious about the period of time available for in-person um, early voting. I, I wasn't certain, I listened to the conversation, but it wasn't clear to me what was the, the when did that begin and how long will that period be? Okay, um, Deborah, do you have an answer to John's question? Um, we're not exactly sure the dates that the ballots will be available, but as soon as they are, uh, probably what we'll do is uh, post hours, because uh, again, we're still on lockdown here at Town Hall. I'm going to have to post somebody at the door. So there'll probably be a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the afternoon. Uh, but as we work out those details, uh, we'll be sharing those. Uh, that information, because there are 
municipalities all, all across the state in the same boat that we are and that information was being presented to the governor's office whether or not we'll get any further guidance on that i'm not sure but uh, that would be the plan now uh, again unless something changes from any guidance is uh, to have posted uh, hours for that and uh, we'll be posting that on the website in on the south side door here at town hall which is the main entrance now uh, to town hall for appointments so Okay, so I, I would just stress we have extraordinary interest in this election. Um, and we have concerns raised all around around absentee voting. Um, and that so John, that, can I, can, yeah, if I could just jump in, I, I appreciate your comments. I, I number one, I, I, I recognize this is an important topic. The, the purpose of this time is intended for things that weren't on the agenda. I don't know if you joined late, and if you did, I can recap quickly a little bit of what Deborah um, articulated, which aside from the in-person early voting, um, there will be multiple um, ways if you've requested an absentee ballot to bring that back, um, whether that be by mail, whether it be a drop box that the town has um, uh, ordered and will be installing, um, or even potentially, um, you know, uh, calling the office and making an appointment to drop it off. So um, if, if, if that's what you're raising concern about, I just wanted to bring up the Deb did already um, go over it in Yeah, uh, I, I thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Gavin. I, I, I did hear the conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, my concern is about in-person early voting, which we've always had for a period of about a month prior to the election. I think it can be safely done. Our, our schools are safely open right now. Um, and I think it can be safely done. And I would encourage the council, the, uh, the town council to, um, to ensure that we have a, the maximum possible available time of early in-person voting that, that is allowable by law. Understood. I have a question um, just in follow-up to that then, Deb. Um, it, it, is there any value or has there been any um, looking into, uh, I know that um, community services and the library are both using sort of different kind of reservation systems um, to, for people to book times for the activities that go on hmm. either at the school and in the pool or at the library. I, I just wonder in the, in the effort of managing traffic and managing headcount in the building, if that is something that is a possibility or, or maybe not not realistic for that purpose i'm not sure i i don't mean to put you on the spot but i i can't I'm imagine not sure trying it... to manage more phone lines um than we already are in question this is the I... online the, uh, you know how like for scheduling the curbside pickup of materials oh. from the library or scheduling a slot to, to do the swimming? Yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, okay. I think posted hours during certain time for morning and, and afternoon will be the best way to do it. Um, we did that in July and it worked very well. Yeah. Um, and again, yeah. we can only have three, like three voters in the building at one time. You know, I remain concerned about lined up traffic, you know, around the building here at Town Hall outside and limited parking and so forth. So, um, uh, but I can certainly, you know, talk to Matt and uh, I just, um, we'll, we'll certainly think about it. It's not, not something that we had thought about, but we'll, I can certainly talk to Matt about it. We, and we, we did put, uh, we did process a lot of people through the building this summer for the July election and it seemed to work extremely well with a door person. So uh, people, if they wanted to come up, they could come up and they might've had to wait at times, but generally if that, their intention was to come in and personally vote and process their absentee right there, uh, or if they wanted to come and hand it to a live person versus uh, put it in the mail, uh, that seemed to work uh, extremely well also. So uh, I thought that the, the way that took place there, you know, we want everybody to vote who wants to vote and we wanna make it as easy as we can for them to vote. Uh, we just need to play within the rules of what the executive orders have laid out that we need to do. So we've tried to be, and Deborah has tried to be extremely creative in trying to find ways to ensure that uh, anybody who wants to participate can, and, and we encourage that. Great. 
Are there other members of the public that um, have it? Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, so, ahead. so uh, just to, to uh, put a put a bow on this. So it sounds like then we have some proposal regarding uh, in-person uh, voting prior to election day, and the current status of it is that it's off now with the governor's office for approval. Is that is that what I I heard? No, no, they can oh, come no. and fill out an absentee ballot in in person here. Uh, with booths that we have, it's just we are restricted on the volume of people who can come in to do uh, that at one time. So when is that opening up? Then has that already opened? I no. don't have the ballots yet, so we'll be ah, announcing got it, got it. it. So it will, uh, we're we're gated on the ballots. Once the ballots come in, then uh, then it, they'll be. Then in. we'll yeah we'll post. And again, I just hope folks think about that and allow us to mail them a ballot. I hope that's their first choice, and they can you know walk it back, put it in the the ballot drop box. Um, so, again. All right, I want to go see if there's anything else um, besides this topic. Uh, anybody else from the public wanting to speak on anything that was not on tonight's agenda? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Council Gaberson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Garman? Yes. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you all. Take care. Good night. Thank you.